Uh, thank you very much, organizers. Okay, uh, today, first, I'll give a general introduction to the stability of inequalities, um, presenting in some sense a general framework and then trying to apply it uh, to the fractional Kappelli von Nirenberg inequality. Uh, this is an ongoing work uh, with uh, collaborators, uh, Nicola Denitti and Tobias Koenig. Okay, so first of all, uh, let us start with a very, very simple example, uh, but uh, which is made to show the structure that we want to study. So uh, we consider the following inequality, which is fundamentally trivial. Uh, this is super easy. What I want to say is that on the left hand side, on the left hand side here, we have a norm which is induced by a scalar product. And on the right hand side, we have uh, a general function. Let's say everything uh, is too homogeneous, though. Okay, so this is the inequality is trivial to prove. In fact, now I'll prove it in one line and I'll show you also uh, what, what's the stability for this inequality. Let me mention that, for example, in this case, the minimizers. Uh, that are at those points such that equality holds are the family in the diagonal. So, stability in this setting uh, reads as follows. Uh, you just bring everything on the same side. Uh, you notice that this is exactly x minus y squared in our n uh, divided by two. And therefore, and then you notice uh, this is in fact an equality, but we don't really care uh, that this bounds the distance between the point x, y and the manifold m of minimizers. And this is important, in fact, in the same norm which was appearing on the left-hand side. Okay. This is all what I want to say about this toy example. Everything is simple here, uh, but the idea of stability is that you have an inequality, you bring everything on the same side, and you'd like this to estimate your distance from the set of minimizers. In this kind of setting, your final goal is to estimate that in the same norm which is appearing on the left-hand side. Now, let us move. I'm, I'm a little bit, sorry, I'm a little bit confused. Yep. Do you want, you have two X, but the homogeneity is not right. In other words, you have a, Square on the left, no square on the right hand side. Where is the non? Here, there's a square on the first line. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Like this one should be. Yeah, that's, that's, that's too small. <laughs> yeah. That's too small. I don't understand what you got written there. I guess it's that guy. X squared plus Y squared, do it or equal than two X times Y. Nothing fancy. Yeah. I've written it like this. No, no. Indeed, yeah. Good point. I mean, I've, re I've written it like this, even though it's a bit confusing, just because I wanted to make super clear that this is a norm induced by a scalar product, and that's the same thing which is appearing on the other side. Yeah. So, uh, we see that the subvolume inequality. Uh, the L2, L2 star has the same structure. So, and the L2 star is the sum of this point. Okay, uh, as you'll notice, there is a norm on one side, and there's uh, and there's a nonlinear function on the other, everything is uh, too homogeneous. Okay, first thing, first remarks are the symmetries. Like the sobolib inequalities has a certain set of symmetries. Uh, when I say asymmetry, I mean that if I bring everything on the same side, for example, taking the ratio between the left hand side and the right hand side, doing this transformation on u does not change the ratio. So I can, for example, multiply u by a constant, and this doesn't change anything. I can translate, and this doesn't change anything. Oh. Or I can scale. All of this is not changing anything. Then, uh, this is well known, this is a concentration compactness argument. 
minimizers exist. Not only they exist through, through a symmetric rearrangement. <coughs> Uh, through the measure engine, one can also say that minimizers are radial. And once they're radial, one can in fact uh, show uh, that they have an explicit formula. I'll write down one of them. N minus two over two, but that's not super important. What I want to emphasize is that it's explicit. Okay, all of this is well known. Um, and it turns out that one, uh, at, at this point, one has all this information, is the moment to try to prove stability for this inequality. And in fact, this was proven. Well, all minimizers are gonna be looking like that with all these different scales. Exactly, exactly. Uh, it's not only that there are radial minimizers, all minimizers are, Exactly this one up to the symmetry. Yep. So, and in fact, stability is proving much more than this. But as a corollary, gets exactly what you said. So, stability, this was due to Bianchi Agnel. Uh, 90, maybe 1L, don't remember. 91. Mm. So what, what we're doing, we're just bringing everything on the same side. And we want this to estimate the distance. Big U is the way I will always denote a minimizer and small u is a function, any function. And M is always the manifold of minimizers, which in this setting is exactly the talent, one of the talented bubbles up to symmetries. So the infimum of the distance in the norm we expect not an empty bubble. Okay. What I want to do now uh, is in some sense to, to give a proof of this result, which is very general and which later we'll be able uh, to tell something also about other inequalities. So what's going to happen now is that we started from something very concrete and we are going into something a bit more abstract, like uh, we consider a very general set of inequalities. So this C, this C is, is, is the best C, right? Yes, yes. Uh, this is also something that I'll do often. Uh, big C, sharp. I, if, I want to, if I want to hide it, I will do like this. Then it's not sharp. I'm just saying that there exists a constant. Exactly. Okay. So the sharp C is also known, obviously, right? Yeah, 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 it's known, but uh, the formula is rather bad. Like there's yeah. gamma function going on in factorials. Yeah. Yeah, this is also an important thing to say. Like in the slope of inequality, everything is explicit, so everything is much easier. Uh, the point is like to, to create a framework which is robust enough that you can handle also a situation where things are not explicit anymore. For example, in the Caffarelli con Nirenberg inequality. In the fractional case, because in the local case, still everything is. Okay. Um, yeah, there are three more. Kind of inequalities we want to study. Uh, there's this thing that I've repeated that on the left hand side, we don't just want a norm, we want something which is induced by a scalar product. And in fact, <clears throat> we want to study inequalities with the following form L U U. This scalar product is in L2, then I'll say something about the operator L. With a recall, then a constant, uh, which I could absorb into the operator L, but I prefer to make it explicit. Uh, U x minus t squared. Okay, this is the general form of the inequality we want to study. And what 
I mean, I have, of course, I have to say something about the various things appearing. So first of all, L self-adjoint, positive discrete spectrum, and scaling. When I say scaling, I mean that uh, if I compute uh, the operator L on a scale function, is exactly as computing the operator L of the function, evaluating it in a scaled way up to a multiplication by a certain power of lambda, which is not important. OK. Then one, of course, need to, to you to impose a constraint on the scaling, like I want the two things to scale the same way, but this is trivial to impose once you know this exponent here, and this impose a constraint on the uh, on t minus n over p, depending on the scaling of the operator L. Okay. Then there are much more technical assumptions, but in some sense, they are almost always true. Uh, so I'll just keep them. Mostly, it's the fact that one, uh, wants to have uh, concentration compactness. One wants to, and when I say concentration compactness, I mean that if you have a sequence of minimizers, uh, of almost minimizer of the inequality, you want it to converge up to symmetries to the right thing. Okay. Uh, there will be more assumptions, but I just want to write down these ones because these ones are the crucial ones. And I want to emphasize that these ones are, in some sense, almost always true. So, uh, going back to your slope, yeah. one, you're your L would be would be Laplace, but that wouldn't have discrete spectrum. Uh, minus Laplace. Yes, yes, you're completely right, in fact. Okay, so remark. What I present as I present it does not work. Uh, for the sobel of inequality. And in fact, I'm wondering if this discrete spectrum is truly needed for L itself. Let's say, but in any case, what I'm saying, it can be easily adapted to the case of the Sobolev inequality, but it does not directly work over there. But it's not only because it doesn't have uh, discrete spectrum. Like, as observed in the case of the Sobolev inequality, L would be minus Laplacian. OK. Uh, and it has all the assumptions apart from this spectrum. But in fact, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't even think one needs the discrete spectrum for the operator itself. Uh, one needs the discrete spectrum for a certain modification, which is, again, almost always true. So just. Ignore that assumption. Let's just say that the operator has to be nice enough, and in the applications, it's nice enough. But the real point that I wanted to say is that what I'm presenting will not work for the sobel of inequality for the simple reason that we assume because uh, we will assume no translation invariance. Everything can be adapted to work also for the Sobolev case. Uh, but for the Sinti application in mind is the Caffarelli Gornirammer. There, there is no translation invariance. Everything will be keep, will be made uh, so that it works for when there is no translation invariance. So T is not zero. For example, or, and this may be non obvious here, but also the operator L may be non translation invariance. Because in this example, it is, but the other, exactly. So, uh, there can be two reasons for that. Either t is non-zero, or the operator L is not translation invariant. For example, this can be if the operator L is something like, and this will be the main example. Uh, I comment on why this makes sense and so on and so forth, but. For example, this operator here, uh, this part is non-translation invariant. Uh, so, yeah. Okay. So, uh, what I'll say now is very well known to 
uh, quacks first, but let's present the general framework. Like, what I want to say is that I want to say that under these assumptions, more or less, there's a standard way to reduce the stability of an inequality uh, to a certain spectral problem, which is called non degeneracy. Okay. Uh, approach to stability. Hmm, maybe I should first write the statement of stability in this setting, like what we want to prove. Uh, what we want to prove is the following thing, like L U U minus the norm on the other side, uh, greater or equal, oops, sorry, then the infimum in the same norm. U in the manifold of minimizers. Before going on, I also have to say something about the manifold of minimizers, because in general, one cannot say anything. The main assumption here, and this is the real main assumption, like everything else is in some sense always true, but this one is the real assumption. M is in fact generated by A radial function up to scaling and multiplication. This one, in fact, uh, is the delicate part. Like everything else, as I said, I'm also meeting some technical stuff, but it's not important. This one, in fact, is not always true. For example, as we will see uh, for the Caffrelli con Nirenberg, sometimes it's not true. But the point is that, uh, as I'll comment at the end if I have time, this assumption is not important. Like it's fundamental to prove stability, but it's not important to prove non degeneracy. And sometimes, like having non degeneracy, can lead uh, to this kind of statement. But this is something I want to comment later on. Okay. So, well, how, how can one get this kind of statement? So, step zero. Here on the right hand side, we have an infimum. What we are going to do is just to choose the u which minimizes uh, that distance. So, let u be the minimizer. of that quantity. Okay, so what you have to imagine is that there is this manifold of minimizers, which is two-dimensional. <laughs> there is your function u here. Then you choose the closest big u that belongs here. And of course, given the minimization property of u, you will have an orthogonality between the difference of the two u's and the tangent space. And in fact, uh, that's exactly what I'm going to write here. So by minimality, you get that the difference u minus u is orthogonal with respect to this color product, which I will just write an L here to remember, is orthogonal to the tangent space. Okay. Uh, from now on, we call this difference pi. So uh, u, small u, is equal to big U plus phi. The idea is that we want to tailor expand around uh, uh, big U and show that the stability is fundamentally uh, can be reduced to a statement for the Taylor expansion. OK. So step one, uh, which is more or less always, it always works whenever there are minimizers, so there is concentration compactness. Uh, step one, uh, we can assume that phi in the norm we are considering is much smaller than u itself. So what I'm saying is that I can assume that my function u is very close to the manifold of minimizers. This is in some sense, I, I can see if you, if you are able to prove qualitative stability, then you can immediately assume this, for example. 
And the qualitative stability is usually much easier than quantitative stability. So uh, let's take this for granted. And once you have this, you want to tailor expand. But before tailor expanding, you have to you have to compute the Euler Lagrange equation for, for everything. Because I mean it's the first step, it's the first variation, and then you have the second variation. So uh, normalize you so that using the symmetries, uh, so that you have the the following quantity is equal to one. Then you can write down cleanly uh, the Euler Lagrange equation, and the Euler Lagrange equation reads as follows. I'm writing it down because it will be needed later. Okay. Up to now, more or less, nothing happened. Like one has chosen the best U, has said, okay, by compactness, I can assume I can, I'm very close. Mm, I mean, U is a minimizer, so it must satisfy a certain uh, a certain equation. And here, the point is that you compute the, the second variation. And it turns out that magically many terms disappear, and you get this, fun, this wonderful formula. So this is the quantity we care about. And they claim that the following formula was like L U U minus U X minus T P square with a C, which I also here. <laughs> yep. This quantity here, the idea is that you tailor expand around the big U. Remember that uh, small U is U plus five, and you get that this is equal. To the following thing. We thought, of course, as well. Here, I mean, in any reasonable norm. Okay. So you, you get something quadratic in phi and something sub, more than quadratic. Okay. And now, now you notice that what is really happening is that if this quantity can be bounded from below by a certain multiple of this, then you're empty and you immediately deduce uh, your result. Because notice that in this setting, this quantity here complicated is nothing but L phi pi. On the other hand, if this, if this term here cannot be bounded from below by a multiple of L phi phi, then you will never get this statement. So it's more or less equivalent. And even more, and this is where uh, the discrete spectrum I was talking about, which maybe is not really important, uh, comes into play. Mm, yeah, because the, the reality is that you need the discrete spectrum, not of that, but of a certain L divided by something, but I don't want to enter into anything that technical. The point is that step four, like what you would like to prove is that L phi phi minus that term there minus that term there uh, is greater or equal than epsilon L phi phi for any phi orthogonal to the tangent space. But it turns out that you don't really, I mean, this would follow immediately also if you were able to prove just greater than zero. And let me remark that, in fact, you know greater or equal than zero. Like greater or equal than zero, this, this comes out of the fact that big U is a minimizer, so the second variation must be greater or equal than zero. Like the action at the minimizer is greater or equal than zero. This condition is saying that the kernel cannot belong to the orthogonal of the tangent space, and this is called non-degeneracy. And this comes out of the normal names for minimizers. So. This condition here is called non-degeneracy.
But we are assuming that you proved that, right? No, I am just assuming it. I've never yes. proved it. Yes. Sadly, uh, in fact, in general, this is false. Like, you cannot hope that all minimizers are non degenerate. Uh, but what I've shown here is that if for some reason you are able to prove non degeneracy, then immediately you get stability. In fact, non degeneracy is telling you a lot about inequality, but let's just stop here about that. Okay. Maybe I should have asked this question before, but at the very beginning. But yeah. So the fact, so in there, in your example, right, uh, in the so of inequality, you also know what is the optimal constant, right? Correct. So, so what, what, what kind of role, that must play a role, whereas I don't see what role it's playing in your general abstract framework. The fact that C is the optimal one, no? So are you assuming that C is the optimal? Yes. Okay. Yes. Wow. And where do you see that? Like, I guess you see example, the manifold of minimizers. The fact that U uh, okay. is satisfying the big U is satisfying the equality, and it's satisfying an Euler-Lagrange equation. Ah, I missed. I missed uh, the equality. Like this one. This one is optimal. Okay. And big U. And Whatever I ever call big U satisfies. Okay, so this one is big E. Yeah. Because uh, once you have that, then you can really start there. You have a nonlinear okay. equation. Okay. Which, which, Sorry? You have non, it's a nonlinear equation, which you get from the Correct. Position. Exactly. And the nonlinear equation is this one. That one is exactly the Euler Lagrange equation you get for big U. Okay, I'm sorry, I think I missed something. Instead of three, isn't there like a term LU, comma phi? In step three, yes, once again. Here, yeah. Cross term LU, comma phi. L, that's a good point, but LU, comma phi is zero. Why? Good point. Um, because of this, because you know that phi is orthogonal with respect yeah. well to the tangent space. Yeah. Is one, and you know who belongs to this space, for example, you itself. Okay, well, at that I don't understand. Why does you belong to the. Because uh, uh, if you multiply you by a constant, it's still a minimizer, so it still belongs to the. Yes, yeah, exactly. That's a good point. In fact, maybe, I mean, this is a very good observation. This is the only thing I'm using. Like everywhere in the computation, I'm not really using that phi belongs to the orthogonal to the tangent space. I'm just using that phi is orthogonal to you itself. Which is a consequence, thank God, of that. Yeah, exactly. In general, I mean, in general, this is false. This is true only because phi is of that. Yeah. Can I ask now? Yeah, please. So, do you, did you say that uh, you might be, uh, so some of the minimizers might be non degeneracy, but some others might be not? Yes. In general, I mean, for, I mean, if for, for a single inequality, if you assume that the manifold of minimizer is given by, uh, by this, this like it's given by a single one and up to symmetry, then either all of them are non degenerate or all of them are degenerate. But in general, there might be there are inequalities for which minimizers are degenerate and inequalities for which minimizers are non degenerate. It's some property of the uh, operator L of the inequality of the inequality as, uh, as a whole, not only of the operator L, like uh, maybe I've written it somewhat, yeah. It's a property of the inequality itself. Like, for example, for the Sobolev inequality, this is true, and this is in fact what Bianchi Egnel proved. Like, one would say that Bianchi Egnel, uh, they, are, they are using this framework in a maybe more restricted way, like, because they just wanted to apply it for the Sobolev inequality. But then the main point is that they prove non degeneracy. And then once they have non degeneracy, they get everything. Uh, but the fact is that proving non degeneracy is in general hard, in general false, in fact. Hmm. And they are able to do it because everything is super explicit. Good for them. Yeah. Any other question? Okay. So, so what cases does non-degeneracy fail? Or is it known to fail? Yes. Uh, for example, I'll say it. I mean, at the very end, I'll discuss the Caffarelli con Nirenberg inequality. There, it fails. And this is, in fact, the one of the main reasons why it's super, super interesting. But uh, I'll say it later. Yeah. 
yeah, in some sense, because everyone was thinking that non-degenerism must be always true for decent inequalities, and it turns out that for what one could, would consider a decent inequality, it's not true. Anyway, uh, yeah, so non-degeneracy. Now I'll, I'll give you a tool to prove non-degeneracy in a special case, of course, because one cannot hope to prove it in general. So uh, for non-degeneracy, Degeneracy, which I may call ND from now on, we assume a bit more <clears throat> on the operator. We assume that L has the following form. At the very end, it will be clear why one assumed this. So, first of all, what is S? What is K? K is a number and it's a non-negative number. This is important. In fact, for k negative or very for k very negative stability phase. Okay. Then uh, what is s? Is an exponent between zero and one. Again, one may one may use everything to prove also the local case, but it's not what I want to do today. So I just assume that s is between zero and one. And what definition should one take of the Laplacian uh, to a power which is not integer? You can take either the spectral definition or the integral one. I just recall the integral definition up to constant, which is not important. Uh, minus Laplacian or a function evaluated at u, at x, sorry, uh, is equal to ux minus ui. Uh, excellent. Okay. At the very end, we will understand why we care about these kind of operators. Okay. Uh, in this setting, everything simplifies a bit. In particular, if you assume this, then the Euler Lagrange equation that I have written explicitly there becomes the following thing. And I will just call this f, small f of x and u. So you can completely forget about everything which is appearing there. Uh, you just have to imagine that you have a function, a function big U, which is radial, decreasing. These were assumptions. These, these are, in fact, the hard assumptions. But once you know that U is radial and decreasing, you just have to remember that it satisfies this kind of equation. OK. And then we have the euler lagrange equation, but then one may say, okay, but this in this generality, I mean, maybe also for this operator, still the non-degeneracy doesn't, doesn't have anything to do with f. It turns out that the non-degeneracy can be written using only the function f. And in fact, it can be written nicely using only the function f. The definition is the HS norm, maybe with a dot. Non degenerate is equivalent to this set, this thing here. Uh, okay. You see, everything simplifies a lot, and you can even forget about the, the complicated formulas. You just have a function u which satisfies a non-local equation depending only on a function f. And you'd like to prove this kind of inequalities, not for all phi, but only for certain phi's. Remember that we want to prove non-degeneracy only for phi uh, orthogonal to the tangent space. And now uh, it will be clear how to use it, and it will be clear uh, why it's true in general. I mean, in this setting. OK, so case one. If phi is radial, then uh, this was already proven. This was already known. Known. 
uh, due to uh, how De La Torre Gonzalez. <coughs> Okay, we are happy. I'll not say much more about this. Of course, there is this issue that phi can be non radial. I mean, non degeneracy must be proven for all functions. But then, since you already know it for radial functions, it's not easy to assume to reduce to the case of phi orthogonal to radial functions. And once you are in case two, you can completely forget uh, about uh, this assumption here, because this assumption here plays a role only if phi uh, as a radial part, because everything in this in this world here is radial, uh, and we are, this is a consequence of ruling out uh, translation invariance. Therefore, if already you are assuming that phi uh, is orthogonal to all radial functions. You are, you are good to go, you have to prove the non-degeneracy for all such files. And in fact, this is what we do. Uh, in a general setting. So let you, you can completely forget about all the complicated stuff over there. And you just assume that u is radial and decreasing. And it satisfies the following inequality. Uh, for a given u, for a given f, so that d1 f is decreasing. So we want that f is decreasing when we go away in the radial direction. Notice that, for example, here this is true because the powers are all negative. Uh, I've never said it, but yeah, the powers are, are both negative. Uh, and here it's important that k is greater or equal than zero. Otherwise, you don't have this assumption there. Then immediately, uh, you can prove non degeneracy. You can prove uh, that phi. Hs squared is strictly greater than that. And you don't have to assume anything on you. You doesn't have to be a minimizer of anything. Mm -hmm. For all phi orthogonal to radial functions. And when I say orthogonal to radial function, I mean that the integral over any ball centered at zero is zero. OK, you see that since case one and case two, even though it's not obvious, they are covering all cases, uh, since everything can be split uh, as an orthogonal sum of something radial and something orthogonal to radial functions, and the inequality itself splits along this decomposition, <laughs> one obtains non degeneracy in the setting, one obtains non degeneracy for this kind of operator, so one obtains non-degeneracy and stability for that kind of inequalities uh, whenever k is greater or equal than zero. OK, for the final part of my talk, I left to first a little blackboard. And then I briefly talk about the Caffarelli con Nirenberg. This is mostly, uh, I will just say some results which are known and say how what I've said applies to the fractional case. And here we will see that sometimes non-degeneracy non fades, in fact. OK. The Caffarelli con Nirenberg inequality is a generalization both of the Sobolev inequality and of the uh, what's the name? Uh, the inequality. And it reads as follows the integral of gradius squared divided by a certain power, greater or equal, again, C is the optimal constant and it exists. Uh, I'll write it later. Okay. 
Ah, this the Caffarelli con Nirembe viene fuori. What is known? Uh, maybe I'll not be super precise uh, giving the references, but mostly it's either due to Caffarelli con Nirenberg, Katrina Wang, Feli Schneider, or, and I'll mention that uh, very precisely at the end, uh, Durbo Esteban Loss. So minimizers exist. So the constant C, uh, the constant C exists itself. But in general, in general, and this is truly remarkable, in general, they are not radial. When I say in general, of course, I, I have to say something about the various parameters appearing, like alpha, beta, and t. Uh, t is between 2 and 2 star. Uh, alpha and beta must be related by a certain scaling for sure. <clears throat> but I mean, and there's also another technical assumption, but I want to completely omit it now. Okay, in general, they are not radial. But they're explicit. That's a good point. The radial ones, they are explicit. Like what is explicit is the following thing. The radial minimizer minimizers among radial functions always exist and are explicit. Not only this, you can also repeat the whole framework in this setting. I mean, even though I've never said it, everything works even if you just take a minimizer in the radial functions. You can still do all of what I mentioned there. And this was uh, a result by Feldy Schneider I mean, this minimizer um, in the radial class is unique, but it's not necessarily a global minimizer. Then Feli Schneider, how can one, for example, show this? A way to show this is to compute the second variation exactly as I've done that there and prove that non-degeneracy fades badly. When I say badly, I mean that not only that's not greater than zero, it's not even greater or equal than zero. And that's exactly what Feli Schneider do. Uh, and they prove that uh, there is an explicit alpha zero, which depends on uh, n uh, p, so that uh, alpha greater or alpha zero, if and only if uh, the radial minimizer is non-degenerate. Then if alpha is equal to alpha zero, uh, you get that still you have greater or equal than zero, and if alpha Alpha is strictly below alpha zero, you, the, the non degeneracy fails badly, and therefore they have proven, in particular, in particular, as a corollary for alpha below alpha zero, the minimizer is not radial. So it's a stable. Correct. That's what you're saying. Correct. It's not radial. No, I mean, not only unstable, like really the minimizer is not radial. For alpha equal to alpha zero, you have instability in some sense. So you have non-degeneracy, but still the minimizer is radial. But- Well, the radial guy, I'm just thinking is a critical point, which is- Correct. Ah, okay, as a critical point. As a critical point. Correct, yes, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. yes. Of as a critical point, yes, and in particular, it's not even a- but As the minimizer, it has to have a hash. Which is not negative, right? Yes, a, a, a global minimizer, a, a, even a local minimizer. Yes. Okay. But if you just take the minimizer in the in the radial class, so it might be a non-local, not even a local minimizer, and that's exactly what they. Uh, I mean, then, I, then, I, then it's not a, then it's not a real, it's not a, it's not a global minimizer, it's local. Or... Correct. But when alpha is equal to alpha zero, it is at the same time a global minimizer, and you don't have non-degeneracy. Okay. In the space, that's exactly like, like what you want. Well, your your action uh, has a zero. Moment. Correct. Correct. I mean, I guess because the uh, because of the structure of the of the of the functional the minimizer among the radial functions is always going to satisfy the Euler-Lagrange equation. Correct. It's always going to be a critical point. Mm, yeah. Correct. And 
now you're saying for alpha bigger than alpha zero is the global minimizer? This, uh, this is, I've, just, I've still not said. I've just said that it's a local. It's a local minimizer and non degenerate. Correct. Alpha is equal to alpha zero is degenerate. Correct. And if alpha is less than alpha zero, it's unstable. Exactly. Correct. Okay. Uh, I misunderstood what you meant by unstable. I thought that you meant it's a minimizer, but it's non stable. But yeah. you actually, yeah. yeah. Okay. And then uh, the question. It, I mean, the, 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 there's a question which remains open in this picture, uh, which is, okay, and what about alpha greater than alpha zero? Is the radial minimizer a global minimizer? This was finally proven uh, by Dolbo. Esteban Loss <laughs> in 2016. Uh, if alpha is greater or equal than alpha zero, then the minimizer, the global minimizer, is radial. OK. Uh, I'll say, I mean, it will be clear later on why this alpha greater than alpha zero is necessary when I say something about the fractional setting. Uh, in the fractional setting, Setting, as you'll see, many things are similar, but there is a crucial difference. The crucial difference is the fact the minimizers are non-explicit. And this changes everything, because here it's super important, but in fact also here it's super important that this alpha zero is explicit, which comes from the fact that u is explicit and blah, blah, blah. So fractional. And with this, I'll conclude. CKM. Uh, this was first studied by Ao de la Torre Gonzalez. Yeah. Okay, so you take when you want to move something from the local setting to the fractional setting, you just take uh, a gradient and you transform it into an integral. So the inequality reads as follows. And once again, you have to modify, of course, all the parameters. You have your new parameter, which is S, which will belong will be between zero and one. And then guess what? You have the P no more up to two star, but up to two star S, which is two N divided by N minus two S. And finally, the condition gets modified uh, just a tiny bit, but it's not important. B minus alpha is not more one minus, but it's S minus the same quantity. Okay, uh, I'll be quick because I'm finishing my time. Uh, here, once again, uh, they introduce inequality. Uh, they prove it. Uh, they prove the existence of minimizers. And they prove, and this is crucial, uh, this is due to Aule La Torre Gonzalez, which I've written on already on another blackboard. For alpha greater or equal than zero, minimizers are radial. How do you prove this? Ah, uh, this is by by rearrangement. Like in this, uh, under this assumption, the rearrangement works. Okay. But then they are not able to prove uh, that uh, these are non-degenerate, or at least they don't do it in the paper. And this is somewhat interesting due to the result I've mentioned before by Dolbo. Like, one would like to prove the same result also in the fractional case, even though this may be a bit hard, and maybe I'll mention it as an open problem at the very end. <laughs> in fact, what we do by applying what I've, done, what I've said before is that we prove exactly this non-degeneracy. Uh, same co-authors as before for alpha uh, greater or equal than zero, uh, the radial minimizer, which is a global minimizer, uh, is non-degenerate. We can prove also a bit more, uh, but it's technical and I don't want to discuss it here. 
But one may say, okay, but this seems absolutely unrelated to what you've said before. Like this inequality seems to be completely unrelated to the framework uh, I've described uh, above there. Like what is L? Mm, there are no apportion going on here. Uh, the point is that the proof is one line uh, given the other result. And it's just a transformation which was also introduced by Aldo Torre Gonzalez, <laughs> which in fact was first introduced by Dolbo Esteban Los and I guess by many other uh, before them, because uh, because this is the general idea to first approach uh, Caffarelli con Nirenberg inequality if you want to prove something sharp, and it's to consider the following function. If you consider this function, it turns out that this mess rewrites magically as follows. Uh, where you have, of course, a relationship between uh, the two exponents, which is S minus <laughs> given by scaling, which is the following one. Okay, so up to this transformation, you get this, and it turns out that this is exactly what comes uh, when you when you consider operators of this form. So this is exactly what I've mentioned there. And one may say, okay, and where, where are you using alpha? The point is that, of course, this k is not out of nowhere. This k depends on alpha, depends on everything, but in particular on alpha. And it turns out that k is greater or equal than zero if and only if alpha is greater or equal than zero. Oh, sorry, yeah, alpha is greater or equal than zero. Uh, and therefore, we have finally reduced uh, to what I've said there. To conclude, I'd like to say that uh, we can prove a bit more. We can prove that we can go a tiny bit in the negative numbers, but that's not super interesting. And I'd like to mention that what one would like to prove is the, I mean, the final goal would be to show the equivalent of the ball estimate loss, even though we are not close to that and I'm not even sure it's so, but that would be in some sense the final goal, showing that non-degeneracy of the radial minimizer, which always exists, is equivalent to the fact that it's a global minimizer. Uh, with this, I conclude. Thank you very much for the attention. Questions? Uh, I, I was a bit confused on the last proof here. So yep. uh, you're saying by doing this transformation, you transform this inequality to that guy there? Uh, I'm saying that if you if you just plug, I mean, you do this transformation here, and you can compute all the terms over there. Like you replace everywhere you appear, you replace it with W times X to the power alpha. You do a bit of computations. You go on, you go on, you go on. And at a certain point, you, you find out that that thing written there is equivalent to this thing written here. Sure. So then you can apply this and say all minimizers are radial. That all minimizers are radial is something that one already knows. The fact is one can apply this and obtain non-degeneracy. And see. that is, for example, I mean, as a corollary, one gets stability. If you want something a bit more, like, because non-degeneracy is what by experts is considered to be the important thing. But if you want something more... Uh, concrete, you get you get stability, for example. Uh, okay, then, then I think I missed something. So you said here all minimizers are radial, but for the actual Caffrey and Nuremberg no. minimizers need not be radial. Only for alpha greater or equal than zero. Ah, okay, that's and good. this is true. In fact, I'm not sure I've ever said it anywhere, but this alpha zero, which is the threshold, is always negative. Ah, I see. Okay. Ah, okay. 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 I was about to ask you. So. Yeah. How how it comes that it has a different, it doesn't have a different behavior. No. I mean, potentially, potentially. It be, no. Potentially, that result might not be sharp and alpha might. Absolutely, be absolutely. Nobody, nobody, nobody thinks. No, in fact, we can prove. No, we can. I mean, I was saying something for. No, anyway, anyway, nobody believes that this is sharp. Okay. Yeah. I mean, if you were to guess a nice dependence, maybe SS approaches one, you would imagine you're converging towards. I think this is false. It's false? I think so. So there's um, something going on with the fact that this is basically infinite dimensional and you have funky. Uh, now I might remember wrongly, but either uh, in this paper by Audela Torre 
Gonzalez or in another paper, which is in fact our main inspiration, even though I've never cited it, so I, I should. Like uh, there's a paper by Musina Nazarov, and I think there is a minor remark somewhere where they say that when S approaches one, uh, the behavior of the threshold does not go to the Feli Schneider. Like Feli Schneider are the one introducing this alpha zero, which is in fact called out uh, usually uh, constant of Feli Schneider. Uh, and it turns out that when S approaches one, one can show that uh, if there was a constant also in the fractional setting, it would not converge to the one by Feli Schneider. But uh, I'm not 100% sure about this. So okay. that's it. That HS is the homogeneous one, though. Yes. I mean, uh, I mean yeah. like, like, like uh, in, in, no, if I've ever no, no, down, down here. Here? Here. Yeah. Uh, uh, this is. Uh, I mean, the one that is given by a. I mean, otherwise, you could be able to apply the. Exactly. Uh, the, the framework, exactly. Right? exactly. Exactly. So, so in the uh, alpha less than alpha zero case, uh, you know that uh, the minimizer is not. Uh, Correct. In the, in the local case, uh, this is due to the Bo Esteban and loss. And for us, uh, no, no, it's only the fact that there it's this due to Felix Neider. I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, but nothing is known. Like, I think that literally nothing is known about minimizers in that setting. So, do you know, for example, those non radio minimizers is unique or? I don't know. And honestly, I think that nobody knows. But the only thing that I can be sure is that I don't know. <laughs> I mean, is there actually enough compactness to say that there must be an Ovedo minimizer? Yes. 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 Um, there's also a point like here. I mean, we, we, I, I, I didn't say anything about that, but one can, in fact, uh, allow both, both equality case, but every, all the behavior changes. And in fact, if you allow P equal to uh, two, you don't get the existence of minimizers. Okay. Because you get the idea in the range, you still can, can use concentration of methods. Yes. That's what Correct. that's what you're saying. Yes, sir. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. And so and the same has to exist. Like the reason why I'm always putting these strings, strong things is that these allow this ensure the existence of minimizers. Huh. Correct. Okay. Uh, is there anything known about these stability results when you're not on RM? Uh, like if you're on a bounded domain or uh, I, th I think that the answer to this question, I mean, again, I don't know much, but I think that the answer to this question is yes. <laughs> uh, I think that, for example, if you can write down something which resembles a sobolev inequality on a manifold and it's sharp, then I think that a method like the one of Bianchi Agnell applies. But, but you don't have to couldn't, you couldn't, couldn't get, you know, like, an approximate minimizer as it approaches, for instance, Rn. I mean, say that, you know, when you're spreading the function a little bit more, yeah. it fails. I mean, like, you have to understand yeah, because yes. of the scaling invariance, yes. it might actually be that, you know, it's more and more convenient to actually pick the function. And so kind of, you know, the optimizer is going to leave on the tangent space. Correct, correct. Now, I mean, you don't, you not only need to have something which resembles the sobolev inequality, you also need something which resembles the sobolev inequality and it does a minimizer. Which okay. on a manifold, it's often false, as you were okay. observing. Yes. I mean, which means somehow that for some reason you you, you have to have it doesn't have to be convenient to be, to be convenient to like yeah. okay, go towards our end. Exactly. Mm, I have an understood an assumption, yeah. but I mean if something has a point current inequality, that point current inequality you could try to study its stability, right? Um this is a home method, yeah. yeah but, a but critical one. This this would be the one that comp compensation comp uh, concentration compact. Okay, that looks. But the concrete inequality concentration doesn't. I see. Yeah, but anyway, the concentration compactness is a concentration compactness. So you're rescaling. Indeed, right, right. And you're compensating yeah. the tangent of the menu. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, if, if you don't have an assumption like, like that, then that can happen, of course, you could even just say, okay, in a generalized sense, the minimizer is going to be like, you know, the one in RN. You can still try to, like, you know, make sense. Right, of right. I'm just saying, like, I mean, you can still make the statements. Uh, you know, indeed, I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, okay, the thing is that you can write down a statement, yeah. and it's simple enough. I think it's not. No. Okay, uh, but it doesn't. It's not obvious to me how to write a statement. But okay, that is difficult to. Uh, that is diff it's difficult to prove you wrong. Now, indeed, <laughs> it was a completely empty state of mind. You just see, oh, it's not simple. <laughs>
Okay, if there are no other questions, thanks. Okay.